Hello boys and girls, this is Daniel for Rock the JVM and in this video I'm going to discuss why type classes are useful in Scala in what I hope will be a short and down-to-earth approach. Now, this video will assume that you know how implicits work in Scala because we're going to use them in what I'm going to write in this video. Now, as always, I will recommend that you code alongside me and whenever you need a refresher on type classes in a very short video, just return to this video. Obviously, I'm going to also provide this video in written form for your convenience at rockthejvm.com forward slash blog. All right, so I'm back in my code editor. Now, type classes are these useful but super abstract concepts in functional programming, which functional programming purists will probably eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner all the time. Now, Wikipedia says that type classes are these type system constructs that support ad hoc polymorphism. What the heck does that mean? And uh, this video wants to be as down to earth as possible, and obviously I'm gonna write some code to prove it. Now, here's the problem. Ever since generics were invented, you've surely come across the need for specialized implementations. In other words, let's say you have some sort of method, generic method, let's call this process my list, which takes the type argument t and receives an argument as a list of t, and you need to return a t value as a result. And uh, in this function's implementation, you will need a result that is obtained by processing this list argument. For the sake of example, let's say you want to sum up all the elements of the list. But here's the problem. If the list is a list of integers, then this sum is the actual sum of the elements in the list. Now for strings, then the sum is the concatenation of all the elements. So notice we have the requirements for different implementations depending on the actual type T that we are going to use. Now um, I'm going to put some question marks here for uh, the compiler to actually accept my code. And uh, I'm also going to add another constraint that for other types, we should get an error. So uh, we should not be able to use this method for any other type other than integers or strings. And we want to do this automatically. Now, if you're in other languages, uh, these languages might solve this problem in a different way. If you're in Java, you might kiss this dream goodbye. If you're in C++, there is a technique known as template specializations. And in Scala, we are going to use an elegant way of dealing with it. Introducing implicits. So here's what I'm going to define. In Scala, we can enhance this method, process my list, with implicit arguments which can enhance its capability and also constrain its use at the same time. Now let me give an example. I'm going to define a trait that I'm going to call summable. This will receive a type argument t and is going to only have a single method. I'm going to define a method called sum elements which takes an argument of type list t and is going to return a single t in the style of the requirement that we have for our method. So we are uh, going to pass a list of integers and complete uh, can return its sum and then pass a list of strings and then return uh, the concatenation of all the elements. So this will be represented by this trait summable t. Now, I'm going to add some implementations for the summable t, which are applicable for ints and strings, and we're going to provide the implementations for some elements in a different way. So I'm going to define some implicit objects. So I'm going to define an implicit object, I'm going to call this int summable, which extends summable int. So this is specialized for int, in which the sum elements method is going to take the list argument and is going to re return list.sum because we know that the list has type int and we have access to the sum method because uh, we have uh, a list of numbers. And I'm also going to add another implicit object. I'm going to call this string summable, which extends summable string. And I'm going to provide another implementation of this abstract sum elements method. So I'm going to uh, define 
some elements and this time we're passing a list of strings and I'm going to concatenate all the strings that are contained in this list and I'm going to use the um, very convenient function make string. So list make string with an empty separator will simply concatenate all the elements in this list. If the list is empty, then this should return the empty string. So notice that we have two different implementations for this summable trait. Now we can enhance the original method process my list and I'm going to put it down below because we are going to need it in main. So I'm going to process my list and I'm going to pass another argument in the form of an implicit summable of type summable t. So we're adding another argument list for process my list and uh, I'm going to return a t because I accidentally removed that and because I have access to a summable of t then I can use this inside the process my list implementation. So instead of the question marks I'm going to simply say summable dot sum elements for the list that we pass in the first argument list. Now because we have defined process my list the method in this way the compiler needs to make sure that when you invoke it an implicit summable of the right type is available. Let me give an example. If I write the main method and I call process my list and I pass in list one two three then this call is applicable is okay because process my list will need an implicit instance of summable int which we have in the form of this implicit object in summable all right so we have a value of type summable int that the compiler can automatically inject here so the compiler will automatically inject int summable right here although we don't have to specify it ourselves the compiler will put it there for us now let me obtain a value here let me call this um int sum for the lack of a better name. And then uh, let me also use it for strings. So let's call this string sum as process my list. And I'm going to pass in a list of strings like Scala is and then awesome. And we should be able to obtain the concatenation of all these small strings. Now, if I do print line in sum, and then I copy this and I use string sum after that, and then I try to compile this code, the compiler should be happy with my code because these implicit objects are available to the compiler and the compiler is free to inject them right after the first argument list to the method that I want to call. However, if I want to use process my list with any other type, for example, if I want to do process my list with a list of booleans, then the compiler will yell at me. So if I do process my list with a list of some booleans like true, true and false, something like that. Notice that the compiler added a marker here, no implicits found for parameter summable of type summable boolean, because we only have implicit objects for summable int and summable string for no other type. So notice that we can actually satisfy our constraint that for other types we get an error. And this is actually pretty darn awesome because we get the error at the compile time, not at runtime. So this is error at compile time. The compiler is actually pretty good at spotting lacks of implicits, as was our case. And if I want to run this application, we should be seeing the correct results, which is six, as in the sum of one, two, three, and the concatenation Scala is awesome, as obtained by concatenating all these small strings. So notice that the different implementations for process my list were actually executed correctly. So in this way, these two implicits work as both as a capability enhancer, as we added the extra argument here, and also as a type constraint, because if the compiler cannot find an implicit instance of this summable t, then it's certain that that code will not run, and so the compiler will uh, trigger an error right before the application can actually be run. Now, did you hear type class anywhere in this code? Now, you don't need to. If you absolutely must hear the terms, let me break them down. The behavior that we've just implemented with process my list with an implicit argument of a generic type T is called ad hoc polymorphism. That is because the sum elements capability is unlocked only in the presence of an implicit instance of the trait which provides that method definition 
in this case summable t, right when it's called, right here. So we require the presence of this implicit instance right at the moment when we call the sum elements method. So that is the ad hoc thing. Now polymorphism, because depending on the actual instance of this trait, the behavior of some elements is polymorphic and depends on the actual type t that's going to be used. So that's how ad hoc polymorphism got its name. Now the trait summable t at the very top is nothing special, it's just a plain trait with a simple abstract method. However, when you combine it with one or more implicit instances of this trait, and in our case we have insummable and string summable, we have a pattern which we generally call a type class. This structure allows us to define specific implementations for certain types and not for others. And in our case, we provide implementations for int and string and not for anything else. And the type class pattern allows for this kind of ad hoc polymorphic behavior that we implemented here. That is, define specific implementations for certain types and not for others. All right, so I hope this video was useful and short and down to earth. Now I'm dying for feedback, so leave yours in the comments. And in the meantime, if you like this video, go ahead and click that like button and subscribe. And follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for the latest updates on upcoming material. This is Daniel for Rock the JVM, signing off. <laughs>